Welcome, my name is Anissa Mitchell and I'm with PMD Alliance and you are joined in today for the second part of our Care Partner Series that we are doing in partnership with Kiowa Kieran. Today, we are going to be talking about the emotional tool of caregiving and um, I want to encourage you to open up your chat box. You can ask questions. I want you to share your thoughts. Um, we are going to try to intertwine some of those questions as we're having the conversation today um, and or just comment and maybe even interact with one another. I love it when someone posts something and then another person will, uh, you know, make a comment or like it or whatever. So interact with one another. That sense of support is very important. Um, so feel free to do that. And Really, I'm hoping that uh, care partners are ready to kind of kind of delve into this topic. Um, you really are the glue that holds things together oftentimes. And while we know you provide a lot of wonderful care for others and your loved one, um, sometimes that's not happening for you so much. And we understand that care partners can experience deep levels of sadness and isolation and frustration and guilt, as well as joy. Um, it can be very complicated and complex, and we don't always get a chance to, to delve into those subjects. So we really want to spend some time today um, giving you an opportunity to understand that journey, to share a little bit about that journey, um, and really ultimately to help empower you to find ways to build some self-care margin in your life and self-care i take that with a grain of salt because i'm not talking about take a day off and go get a mani pedi or whatever but what are some things that you can build into your life to build in moments of, of real self-care and kindness for yourself um you if you pre-registered and got an email in plenty of time, you should have gotten two handouts. And if you didn't get them, they will be emailed to you after the program today. But there were two things that you should have gotten. One was a taking care of me care partner self-assessment that you don't have to do right now. You didn't have to do before. Um, but it's something that we want you to use as a tool to kind of come back to and use as a, as a Point of reflection on how are you doing and caring for yourself because you know that whole spiel that they give you when you're on the airplane you've got to put the oxygen mask on yourself first you've heard this before i'm sure before you put it on your loved one and and what does that really mean are you taking care of your physical health are you taking care of your psychological health and mental health and are you setting appropriate boundaries and expectations for yourself and your loved one the second document was um, wellness moment cards. So we shared these a couple of years ago. We we wanted to bring them back. They were a part of another care partner series we did with Kiowa Kieran. Um, and they, they're just little ideas of ways that you can integrate moments of meaning for yourself that doesn't take much time. And it doesn't certainly take away from the care of your loved one or even cost you a lot of money, but maybe help you to take a moment and just have some um, mindfulness for yourself, just a, a little break. Um, so hopefully you'll get those and, and can review those. Um, so with us today is Kate Paris Pesco, and I never say it right because it's such a, I, I'm having a hard time talking today, so bear with me. Um, she is a postdoctorate associate with the National Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on Family Support at the University of Pittsburgh. She has her PhD in mental health and her master's of um, science and public health in social and behavioral interventions at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She has spent the last eight plus years working with Parkinson's disease population, and she did her dissertation work on understanding the role of the caregiver in the quality of life of people with Parkinson's. And so she does have a specific interest in this and an expertise in this, so she's going to be um, sharing some information. But I think you guys heard me say before that we are basing a lot of the material of today's program framed around a survey that maybe some of you completed um, back in 22 with uh, ourselves and Kiowa Kieran. And we, we gathered a lot of data from that as well as we got some really good 
an informative, um, what we called verbatim responses. So people giving us quotes and, and some things. And we took those and we sifted them out and we sorted them into things that people really wanted to know. And so one of those things was just managing their emotional experience of being caregivers and just how to over, overcome some of the stressors and strain um, and find those uh, moments of joy, even in the midst of maybe some difficult things. And so one of the quotes that we're gonna focus on today to kick us off with Kate is, um, this person says, one challenge that I feel is a big one, and that's taking care of my own mental health. Giving support to my husband in this time of need has affected me deeply as well, affecting my mental health. So with that as kind of our framing, I'm going to um, invite Kate to uh, share. She actually does have some slides for this, but it is going to be conversational. So again, we'll encourage you to speak up in your chats. So Kate, thanks for having this conversation with us. Yeah, of course. Thank you all for coming to this session today. I'm really um, privileged to be here and speak with you about this topic, uh, the emotional toll of caregiving. Um, and as Anissa mentions, I welcome any questions throughout the discussion. And if you have anything that you wanna add that's been helpful for you, I think that's really valuable for this group. So please feel free to put that into the chat. So here's kind of an overview of what we'll be discussing today. Um, I think we'll start with uh, the introduction of emotional versus mental health, which was uh, introduced nicely with that quote. Um, and then we'll get into uh, coping with PD, um, some role and relationship changes that can occur, uh, mental health challenges, caregiver burden and strain, physical health challenges, and then some um, barriers and strategies for practicing self-care. So I'm sure you've all heard about the importance of mental health in um, many different ways, uh, especially as you've become a care partner. Um, but I think it's really uh, important to just re-emphasize some of the benefits of addressing mental health. Um, so the evidence suggests that actively addressing mental health issues can improve your overall quality of life and functioning, which allows us to cope with stress more easily. Uh, better mental health is also related to increased uh, self-esteem, and it allows you to think more clearly and be more productive. Uh, lastly, poor mental health can really impact our relationships, um, including the relationship you have with the person you're providing care for. So addressing any mental health challenges can result in improved relationships. And Kate, can I just mm -hmm. say that um, when we did the survey, 87% of the care partners that completed the survey reported a negative impact on their emotional health and 84% on their mental health. And so that's pretty significant. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So I think uh, while that is an alarming statistic, it's, it's maybe nice to hear that you're not alone if you are experiencing these symptoms. And there are a lot of ways to manage mental health um, by seeking treatment uh, and seeking support. And we'll talk about some of those um, throughout the session today. Uh, and I think this might be something you all covered in the previous session, but I thought um, it's important to recognize some of the challenges um, that can you can experience with your mental health during the caregiving journey. So as many of you know, early on in PD, um, oftentimes medication can enable people with Parkinson's to function independently. So the care partner role may not be as um, demanding at that time. But as the disease progresses, you may have to take on more tasks as a caregiver, and that can impact your mental health. So it's really important to consider how uh, the disease progression is impacting you as well as the person you're providing care for. Um, and I think doing things like attending these types of sessions where you can learn more about Parkinson's and how it can impact you is one really great way to get more information that can help you improve your mental health. And then it's always important to Try to take steps every day to practice self-care in whatever way you can. 
And we just had a comment um, about impatience, anger, sadness, all are part of that journey. Yes, that is very true. That actually leads us nicely into the next um, topic, which is kind of thinking about the difference between emotional and mental health. So I often think of these as very interdependent um, components of our health. Uh, but when you think about them separately, mental health really refers to your ability to process information and think clearly, whereas emotional health is more about expressing feelings um, and coping with um, different things that you process for your mental health. So different things like anger um, and feeling or maybe resentment or frustration. Uh, we also often associate mental health with illnesses like mood disorders um, or cognitive impairment, whereas emotional health is more of your ability to cope with stress. Um, and there are definitely treatments for both um, challenges with emotional and mental health. Oftentimes, people who experience problems with their mental health might seek treatment, um, either medication or therapy from a psychiatrist or a psychologist, whereas people who have emotional problems are maybe more likely to see a therapist to discuss these um, problems. But uh, I think, we, as we all know, emotional and mental health are extremely important and they work together cohesively. So if we're able to manage our mental health and our emotional health equally, it can be really helpful for reducing uh, stress, anxiety, depression, and anger, especially as those feelings may come up during the care partner journey. Um, so next I was thinking about talking about coping uh, with the diagnosis of Parkinson's. Um, so as care partners, uh, your lives are influenced by the experiences of your family or friend who has Parkinson's, and it can be very difficult to adapt, um, especially when there's uncertainty around the disease, and you may have some unknowns about what can happen to you and your family. Uh, so on this slide, I have a figure that was developed from some interviews with care partners and people with PD, and during these interviews, participants described how they coped with the Parkinson's diagnosis. So care partners expressed that coping for them meant that they needed to either renounce or change different activities that they once enjoyed. And a big part of um, receiving this diagnosis for their loved one was accepting their role as a family care partner. And I have a quote on the right side of this slide that I'll read out because I think it really um, demonstrates what was found in this study. So this uh, person is a spouse of a woman who has Parkinson's disease, and he shared, you have to accept the disease, that's crucial. And if you don't, you're fooling yourself and making it complicated for the person you're looking after. Um, and then I also oh, want to- I'm sorry to interrupt oh, yeah. you, but like, when you know you're you're interviewing you're talking to these people how do they how do they do that so what's what's the journey of acceptance i think that's something that is very individualized um it kind of depends on your personality as well as the support network you have around you um and the person you're providing care for so i know some people i've spoken with have a person with pd that doesn't want to accept the disease themselves so it can be especially hard to accept it as a care partner if you're caring for someone who doesn't want to accept the disease. Um, I think when you have a strong support network around you, you find clinicians that are helpful, it's maybe easier to accept the disease and try to seek out information that can help you uh, with coping with different changes that can come with becoming a care partner. Um, and I think uh, another thing that came out of this study was some strategies that participants in the study used to cope, which I've highlighted. Um, let me see if I can point to it here in this box on the slide. So being positive, trying to live in the present, um, being patient, which someone had mentioned in the chat, uh, seeking out information, trying to partake in activities, and normalizing the symptoms and new situation as best you can. 
So while this is one study, I think it's really important to recognize that coping will look different for everyone. Um, so it's, it's important to find what's best for you. Um, and I'm sure some people in this group have methods that have worked really well for them. Um, if you wanna try to share those, I think that would be great. Um, but you can always try to ask others what has worked best for them. And I like the comment, education helps with acceptance, knowledge can be power for mm -hmm. sure. I love that. I think that can be helpful for so many people. And, you know, you mentioned it before and, and probably won't fail to mention it again, but, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's nothing wrong with, and it's actually healthy to seek counseling if you're struggling, mm -hmm. because there is, and we're going to be talking about it in the next part of the series, but there is a grieving process to, mm -hmm. you know, even if it's just, this isn't how you envisioned, you know, this time in your life, the season to be, mm -hmm. um, and some of the changes that, you know, you have to adjust in your life. Those, those are losses. And we don't necessarily always give those losses the credit they deserve in terms of the impact on our on our lives and our emotions and so it's you know if you're struggling with that or if you just need someone to talk to it's very very important to you know do that because it does help you then to be able to have what you need in order to turn around and, and be present yes that's so true i think um unfortunately in the, a lot of the studies that i've seen it's maybe there's so much focus on the moving on step but you do really need to process your grief and understand this diagnosis before you can move forward, um, seek out information and plan how your life might change as a result. So I'm really glad that you guys have a session on that because I think it definitely deserves its own session. Um, and kind of related, I uh, wanted to describe some role changes that can occur as you take on the role of a care partner. Um, so I included a figure, I apologize, it's a little grainy, it's from an older paper, but this really shows um, how role strain is affected by disease stage. So here you can see that as PD becomes more severe, um, so as the Honanyar, which some of you may have heard, um, increases, there's worse role strain for the care partner. So this can mean that there's increased tension in relationships, frustrations with communication problems, uh, conflicts between the care partner and the person with Parkinson's, and some mismatched uh, expectations as well. Uh, and one major change that can occur for the care partner is that they have to take on more responsibilities than they had before. Um, so something that's come out of my own research is that care partners share taking on new household tasks that they maybe didn't have to perform before, maybe managing finances, uh, which had been their partner's role, and um, potentially taking a bigger role in medical decision making, especially as Parkinson's progresses. And then I also wanted to show how sometimes uh, relationship satisfaction can be impacted by Parkinson's. And this is uh, especially true for spousal relationships. So there can be changes in communication, uh, attention, sexual functioning, and as we heard a couple slides ago, a reduction or a change in the types of activities that you once, once enjoyed with your partner. So these really all can um, result in role changes for you as a care partner and how you interact with the person you provide care for. And then here I just wanted to share some quotes that came from that same study that I conducted uh, because I think these really capture some of the changes that can occur for someone who's a care partner. Um, and I'll read through them again because I know they might be small on your screen. So this first person described how their relationship with their spouse changed. Um, so she shared, I've lost my partner, my friend, my lover, my confidant, everything. And this person is living here now. I still love him, but he's not the same person. And he's not aware that he's not the same person. He doesn't understand why I'm upset. He honestly has no idea what this has done to my life or our lives. 
Um, and then I had another quote that represents uh, some of the sacrifices that caregivers have to make, um, including changing activities that they would do with their care recipient. So this person shared, if we do plan to do something, we always have to have an out. If we want to go somewhere for a little vacation and we're going with friends, we'll have to drive separately so that when the person with Parkinson's goes down, we can have an out, we can take them back somewhere to a hotel, to the camper, something like that. So that person was really highlighting how she needed to plan further in advance if they were going to be taking any trips, um, which wasn't something that they had to worry about before the Parkinson's symptoms became more severe. Um, there are also some participants in the study that shared the different tasks that they took on as caregivers. Um, so, and these were things that they didn't normally do. So this per one person shared, I'm just taking care of things around the house that I didn't ordinarily, I have to shovel the snow. He does a little bit of that, which I don't want him to do because of the fall risk. Just dealing with anything to do with billing, his appointments, picking up his prescriptions, just things like that. And then for this last quote, um, I wanted to share some care partners in this study talked about how they felt about their role as a care partner. Um, and many people described frustration uh, or feeling overwhelmed, especially at the beginning when they were taking on all of these new tasks. So this one person shared, the hardest part is watching his physical deterioration and feeling pain for his perspective on the disease of being able to deal with that. So not only are you experiencing your own changes, but you're also witnessing the changes in the per person you're providing care for and helping support them through that process, which can really take a toll on you. And Kate, um, yeah. we had a, a quote actually from the survey that kind of spoke to this. Um, one mm -hmm. said that I find that when I put all my energy into caregiving, it becomes a job I do. And then someone had commented to me um, from the chat. So this is somebody who's kind of been through that journey. I process in care partnering in my wife's illness um, as it rapidly progressed. She passed away nine months ago, but I did not realize how intense it was being so focused on her in the days, weeks, and months since I've been dealing with what we now realize is a form of PTSD as I come down from that intensity of this eight-year experience and I'm alone and of a certain age, I'd appreciate you saying a word or two on this letdown because the sadness, anger, guilt, and loneliness have overtaken my life despite being in therapy in a grief support group. So there's oh, a wow. lot in there from that experience. Mm -hmm. Well, at first I want to thank that person for sharing their experience. I'm sure you're not alone in that um, and others might feel comfort in hearing someone else is going through that as well. Um, I think you are doing the right things by seeking out therapy and the support group. Um, I'm hopeful that those will provide you with more support as you're continuing on with them. Um, I think this that really highlights the need for these self-care check-ins um, throughout your pro the process of becoming a caregiver and serving in this role. I think a lot of us can get um, so invested in what we're doing that it's hard to see what you need. Uh, so I think we'll we'll talk about this a little bit later. I, I have a, some questions that you can ask yourself to see if you are engaging in that self-care practice, um, because hopefully that will help people who are currently in this process um, engage in those behaviors. So you are checking in on yourself um, throughout the process. Um, I don't know if any others maybe have experience with losing a loved one that they can share what's worked best for them um, beyond attending a support group or therapy that may be helpful as well. Um, and I did wanna to touch on uh, caregiver mental health a little bit more. I know we talked about it before um, but just to describe some of the impacts of caregiving on mental health uh, that's been observed in the research uh, in the general population as well as the PD population. Um, so both mental and emotional health are impacted by 
constant worrying for the person you're providing care for, uh, as well as the relationship changes that you may experience that we just talked through. And studies um, have compared caregivers to non-caregivers and found that caregivers often report higher levels of stress, depression, emotional problems, and cognitive problems. Um, and even within the Parkinson's population, studies have found that depression for the care um, recipient with Parkinson's is linked with depression for the caregiver. So I think this really shows uh, how interconnected the care partner and care recipient are and why it's important to address mental health for both members of that dyad. Um, and then again, I have some quotes that I think uh, demonstrate how some care partners have experienced changes with their mental health. Um, these aren't from my own studies, but I found them in the literature and I think they're really helpful to better understand this experience. So this first quote uh, comes from a female spouse of a person with Parkinson's who was experiencing some depression. So she shared, I suppose they make me feel a little bit depressed at times because I feel as if I'm losing him a bit. Um, and then the second quote gets at those feelings of loneliness and guilt that care partners can experience. So this caregiver shares, I feel like I've lost my partner. He's become very self-absorbed and it feels like life revolves around him now. It feels like he's living so much in a bubble that he has stopped noticing how things impact me completely. And I actually feel really lonely. I can't find the words to describe how much it's changed our relationship. I feel like I've lost him in a lot of ways. And then the third quote I have shows how the demands of caregiving and responding to the care recipient can contribute to challenges with mental health, um, especially your ability to think clearly. So this person shared, I learned that last year when he was having all those issues, you know, do I have to do what he needs right away? I'm finding it impacts my own executive function and that I'm having a lot more trouble focusing and following through and remembering what I'm doing and all that kind of thing. So I think that's another one that um, really shows how caregiving can become an all-consuming role. And it's really important to check in with yourself and see if you um, are taking time for yourself so that you can think clearly and have better mental health, um, which also impacts how you're providing care. Hey, Kate, we just had a comment. Um, my stress sent me to the ER with atrial flutter. Until that moment, I didn't think I was that stressed and depressed and sad. It had all come to a head. Oh, wow. So that, I mean, that shows the physical impact as well. And I mean, it's so, I think it's so hard to keep checking in, in on yourself. And sometimes um, we really have to rely on the people around us to keep us accountable as well. Um, so I'll talk about this a little, little later as well, but building up your support network is really important too, because that can help you as well as the person you're providing care for. So hopefully you can notice um, if things are getting too overwhelming. Um, and then I think next I wanted to talk about uh, caregiver burden and describe some predictors of caregiver burden. Uh, so some of you may have heard this term before, but I just want to introduce it a little bit um, before getting into um, the predictors of burden. So caregiver burden is a multidimensional construct that really summarizes uh, adverse effects of providing care for someone. So on this slide, I have a figure that summarizes some of the research that's been conducted in this area. Uh, so as you can see, there are some antecedents or predictors of caregiver burden, uh, some attributes or key features of burden, and then some consequences that can result from having caregiver burden. So some general predictors of burden are things like the cost of caregiving, um, challenges with balancing your roles as a caregiver, and the responsibilities you have as a caregiver, 
and reduced social activities. So all of those things can increase your risk of having burden. Um, some key attributes of caregiver burden are that it's driven by the caregiver's perspective. So it's a unique experience for everyone. Caregiver burden uh, is something that, that affects multiple domains of your life. So it can affect your social functioning, mental health, physical health, among other domains. And caregiver burden is something that changes over time and it changes as you as the caregiver change, as well as um, how your care recipient changes. And then some of the consequences of caregiving or caregiver burden include a decrease in the quality of care that's provided, um, a deterioration of physical and psychological health, and a decrease in quality of life. So I just wanted to share this figure uh, because I think it orients us to what can contribute to caregiver burden uh, more broadly, so for the general population. Um, but next I'll go into some more Parkinson-specific caregiver experiences. Uh, so here I have um, how caregiver burden is defined for caregivers of people with PD, and it's De defined as an experience of burden in these seven domains that are represented in these bubbles. Um, so I wanted to introduce these different topics, but also show on the left side of the slide some questions or statements that can help um, you to assess whether you've, you are experiencing burden in these domains. So one of the first domains is physical burden, which can involve injury that might result from caregiving um, or your ability to help with physical activities for your care recipient. Another domain focuses on sleep disruption. Um, so as a caregiver, you may experience frustration and exhaustion um, by performing different caregiving tasks. And you may experience interrupted sleep or problems with your sleep quality as a result of these different tasks or the stress of being a caregiver. Another domain relates to the patient's symptoms. Um, and this includes the caregiver's perceptions of managing these symptoms. Uh, so this domain evaluates both motor and non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's um, and it also incorporates some of the unpredictability of these symptoms that many of you uh, might be aware of. Uh, responsibilities is another domain that references uh, caregivers' perception of their ability to cope with their new role and take over responsibilities that were once their care recipients. So that's something we talked about a little bit with role changes. There's also a domain that encompasses the caregiver's ability to manage uh, different treatments for their care recipient, including uh, medication and managing um, the compulsive intake of medication for some people who may experience that. Uh, next, we have social burden that includes uh, embarrassment the caregiver may feel that can interfere with social interactions and any disruption to social life that occurs as a result of caregiving. And then the final domain is the relationship quality between the person with Parkinson's and the caregiver. So this is really an effect, um, any effect that caring has on your relationship and the impact that it might have on your plans for the future as well. So I know that was a lot of information about what burden is. Um, again, I think it's helpful to have some quotes from uh, actual caregivers who describe their own experience with burden. So this first quote really highlights the unpredictability of Parkinson's. Uh, this person shared, we do not have any usual days now. So that of course can contribute to burden. The second quote really emphasizes how a care recipient's symptoms can lead to activity restrictions for the caregiver. Uh, so this person shared, 
I've been wanting to go on a cruise and we actually had one planned for 2020, but because of COVID it got canceled. Now I'm concerned that we may never go on it because of, of his situation with crowds. He can't handle crowds anymore. It's a definite huge lifestyle change. We're pretty much homebodies now. We very rarely go out. So that just shows some of the changes with social um, socialization that resulted uh, from this diagnosis. And the third quote shows how becoming a caregiver can be surprising um, and it can be very challenging to balance that new role with other expectations you had for this stage of your life. Um, so this person shared, it's a lot of caregiving at a point in my life when I thought I would be free of that. Instead, I think I'm going to have more, but I don't think I'm going to handle that on the road this year. It's going to be very interesting. So I think this is something that was mentioned before as well, uh, just taking on this new role and how unexpected that might be. You probably had plans for what this point in your life would entail, and that was um, changed somewhat by this diagnosis. Hey Kate, we did have yeah. um, a few comments and, and mm -hmm. questions coming through as you were sharing this. It's sparking some really good interaction. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. um, one comment is, I'm just tired. My mom had PD and my husband has PD. I'm 73 and I've been in care mode for 62 years. It's beyond exhausting wow. on every level. Oh my gosh. I, I am. I'm so supportive of you. I can't believe you've had to, you've cared for two people with that disease. Um, I think it's important to recognize that you are feeling tired and hopefully you're able to get the rest that you need. Um, I know it's hard to do that when you're balancing a caregiving role, but I think we'll talk about some strategies to do that. Um, oftentimes you need to bring in additional support because it is a lot for one person to manage. And that goes with this next one, which was, what does one do when there are no other living relatives of either partner and one social network runs away as fast as they can so they don't get asked to help? That's hard. Yeah, that is very hard. Um, I mean, I think one thing I would recommend if, if you haven't tried this already is reaching out to Parkinson-specific support groups because those people might not have the same experience as you, but they may share some experiences and you may find support through that or at least become alerted to resources that they've used that could help you as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's really hard when you can't find anyone in your family or friends that can help you because those are the, the sources that I would suggest you go to first, but it's, yeah, it's challenging for sure. Additionally, and I don't know if this person was at the program we did last week, which was the roadmap, but we had um, Amy O'Rourke and she's an aging life care manager. And sometimes if you don't have the um, informal network to support you, sometimes you can still get what you need through other formal types of supports and they actually can help you figure out what that is. And so mm -hmm. um, we can drop the link. I'll, I'll add that here in a minute of where you can reach out to somebody in that network. They're all over in every state. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's a fantastic um, piece of advice as well. Um, so next we'll kind of keep going with this uh, topic of burden and I just wanted to describe um, some of the predictors of burden related to Parkinson's disease. Uh, so here are some general categories of predictors of burden that include actually both um, the care recipient factors as well as um, factors that are related to the care partner. So first I'll touch on some of the motor symptoms that have been identified as contributing to caregiver burden. Um, some motor complications are one of the strongest predictors of burden. Um, and these can be uh, motor on and, on and off fluctuations that can occur related to medication uh, or things like dyskinesias that can occur particularly as you're taking medication um, for a longer period of time. So the unpredictability of these symptoms can really make it challenging to administer medication on a schedule um, and plan for activities outside of the home. 
which can contribute to reduced social interactions. And then other symptoms related to motor functioning include um, balance challenges uh, like gait dysfunction or fall risk, which again um, can increase your worry about the person you're providing care for. Uh, maybe it makes you feel like you need to be with them more often because you're worried about them falling or that you need to take on more tasks at home because you don't want them to risk a fall. So those are all things that can contribute to caregiver burden. And there's also uh, several non-motor symptoms that contribute to burden as well. So some of the symptoms that are most strongly related to burden are the neuropsychiatric symptoms like anxiety and depression. Um, depression is actually the strongest predictor of burden with people who have depression experiencing greater fatigue, problems with motivation, um, and these often lead to reduced independence, which in turn impacts the caregiver. Anxiety is something else that's really common in Parkinson's, uh, and this can present as a panic disorder, a social phobia, fear of falling. And this can all um, lead people with Parkinson's to avoid different triggering situations, uh, which we saw in that previous quote. And that also limits the capacity of caregivers to maintain a social network because they may have to pull back and not go out as much. Uh, some other symptoms that contribute to burden are impulse control disorders, uh, apathy, and sleep disturbances. And then two symptoms that really um, increase burden and also risk uh, for nursing home pl placement are psychosis. Um, so these are delusions or hallucinations and cognitive impairment. Um, and next, I wanted to talk a little bit about the impact of caregiving on physical health for the caregiver. So, Existing research suggests that caregivers may experience uh, both direct and indirect uh, consequences of their physical health because of their caregiving duties. So these can include increased pain, higher levels of stress hormones like cortisol, uh, reduced sleep quality, and a higher risk of injury. Um, worse physical health is associated with greater intensity of care situations, longer duration of care, and also providing care for someone with cognitive impairment. Physical health consequences can also be related to specific tasks, uh, like becoming injured because you're helping someone get up and out of bed or helping them walk. And it can also, uh, these impacts on physical health can also result from the caregiver not being able to keep up with their own health and attending doctor's appointments. So many caregivers find it hard to attend their normal doctor's appointments and take care of their own health because they're so busy providing care for someone else. Um, but I think this quote is really, uh, that you can see up here, is really important. Um, it says, don't miss your regular health checkup or neglect your health just because you're really busy taking care of your person, your loved one with Parkinson's. Um, because as Anissa mentioned at the beginning of this session, uh, you have to put on your own mask first before you can help anyone else. And it's really important to stay healthy yourself. Can I add like in addition yeah. to this information, the survey that we did, 76% mm -hmm. of the care givers in that survey reported a negative impact on their physical health. Right. Yeah. So it is, it's definitely an area that's impacted by caregiving and something that's really important to address. Um, and again, I have uh, some more quotes that really demonstrate this impact on physical health from the caregiver perspective. Uh, so for this first one, this person shared, I'm worried that I will fall sick. I cannot get sick because I'm a caregiver. The main thing I'm really worried about is my health. I have to keep fit, fit and continue to work. We have very little savings. That is the only thing I cannot retire. 
So they're thinking not only about continuing the role as a caregiver, but also needing um, to stay employed. The second quote, uh, my own health could be a barrier to caregiving. I'm going through my own health things and sometimes I'm tired or I have too many of my, I have to do my own doctor's appointments. So those can all interfere with different caregiving tasks. Um, and this last quote, uh, I just feel like it's cutting into my lifespan because all the stress and everything else can't be good for me. And I worry about the future all the time I worry about having to plan things when something happens to him. So I think these all really show how caregiving can impact um, both physical and mental health as well. And managing those responsibilities can be a challenge um, for many caregivers. Um, and this is kind of a different topic uh, so I don't know if there's anyone that had questions about the physical health component um, or if you're willing to share strategies you use to maintain your own physical health. I think that would be helpful at this point as well. Um, yeah, but maybe I'll go into this. So long-term care, um, uh, the decision to go uh, to put your the person you're caring for into long-term care is of course very personal. Um, it's generally informed by the needs of the person you're providing care for, uh, your family, as well as clinical guidance. Um, but I just wanted to highlight how caregiver strain is related to long-term care placement. Um, and I pulled this figure from a paper that explored the specific relationship. So, you can see some negative factors that can increase caregiver strain and lead to long-term care placement. So things like having diminishing informal and formal support networks, um, not taking time to engage in those self-care practices, um, any situations or life circumstances you had before the Parkinson's diagnosis, and a diminishing ability to manage uh, imposing life events. So those are all things that can increase your strain and contribute to long-term care placement. But I think on the other side, it's really important to point out these uh, things shown in green that can reduce caregiver strain and therefore um, reduce the risk of long-term care placement. So things like planning, um, seeking knowledge, with my, which many people have described uh, in the chat so far, trying to adjust to your new role and new environment, seeking support um, when possible, and engaging in those self-care practices can be really um, important for reducing the need for long-term care placement, um, but more immediately reducing caregiver strain. Uh, and then I also wanted to describe some of the symptoms of Parkinson's that contribute to long-term care. Um, so one of the major symptoms or I guess functioning um, that can contribute to long-term care is any decrease in the ability to perform activities of daily living. Um, so this is generally related to motor functioning. There's also increased long-term care placement for those with more severe cognitive impairment or dementia, uh, worsening neuropsychiatric symptoms, which looks like I have on here twice accidentally, and uh, any behavioral disorders uh, like impulse control disorder, um, and then age is another predictor. Okay, so this next section, I wanted to um, highlight some of the barriers to self-care um, that you may already be aware of, but I think um, these are things that are helpful to think through. Um, so many times attitudes and beliefs can form personal barriers to, and get in the way of you caring for yourself. And sometimes um, it's important to just assess within yourself if you are taking care of yourself like you need. Um, so I have some questions listed here that can help you think about whether or not you're engaging in self-care. 
Um, so do you think you're being selfish if you put your needs first? Is it frightening to think of your own needs? Do you have any trouble asking for what you need? Or do you feel inadequate if you ask for help? Do you feel you have to prove that you're worthy of your care recipient's affection? And do you do too much as a result? So I think those questions are all really important to consider. Um, then I also wanted to share some of the common misconceptions around self-care and around being a caregiver. So some people feel they are solely responsible for the person they're providing care for's health, whether that's their parent, spouse, or friend. Um, you may think if I don't do it, no one else will. Um, if I do it right, I will get the love, attention, and respect I deserve. Our family always takes care of their own. Um, or maybe you promised that you would always take care of this person. So in order to prioritize your own self-care, it's really important to think what might be getting in the way of um, engaging in self-care. So I'll, I'll share these slides after so you can look through these again, but just kind of keep those in the back of your mind. And then I think uh, another thing we've been hearing a lot is that support is very important um, for giving you time for self-care, but also for giving you emotional and mental health support as well. So one of the studies that I've conducted, um, we identified some different barriers to finding support from interviews with caregivers. Uh, one of the key barriers was having concern or guilt related to burdening others. So one caregiver shared, I don't wanna dump on them being their friends or family and have them worry about me or the person with Parkinson's. And then another person shared, I can talk to my friends about what's going on, but none of them are in the same situation. I don't want it to be the only topic, topic of conversation. I could talk for days. Uh, and then another major barrier was finding the right type of support. Um, so as someone in this group already mentioned, sometimes family and friends um, aren't available to support you or you don't, you can't find anyone around you to give you this kind of support. Um, and I did recommend support groups, which can be helpful, but I'll read this quote, which kind of shows that that's not always an option for people. So this person shared, I started going to support groups looking for health, help and found that really discouraging. It wasn't a good experience. I think that the onus is on me to keep trying different groups. Um, so they really recognized that there are multiple types of support groups. Um, and luckily now there are some that are conducted online. So even if there aren't any in your immediate area, you might find one that works better for you. Um, and another person shared that dealing with other people around the disease. Um, so they, they were describing how it's hard to convey to people what Parkinson's really is, and that can present some barriers for support. Um, so they were saying it's not contagious. Just because he's got some problems, he's not a bumbling idiot. He still has a lot to offer in every aspect of his life. So that's a challenge for me. And then another barrier to finding support was the desire to keep the diagnosis a secret, which can be from the person with Parkinson's wanting to keep it a secret, or maybe um, the care partner and the person, to get, person with Parkinson's together. Um, so this care partner shared, we told some family members, but everyone was sworn to secrecy. I didn't want kids, I didn't want our kids to have to answer questions or worry about things. So I'm sure some of you can identify with these quotes um, and how you've experienced your own barriers with finding support or finding the right way to engage in self-care. Hey, can I share um, yeah. some of these? Um, because there's been like really good comments and, and questions. And so I wanna like point out like there are people and you just mentioned it like are new to Parkinson's, their loved mm -hmm. ones just recently been diagnosed. So they're obviously not at that same place and that can be a little overwhelming. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, 
that's fine. You're, I mean, there are things that you can do, obviously, to make it a smoother transition to some degree now, which is why I think having these conversations are important. On the other side of that are some of the comments around some of the challenges accessing resources. And, you know, as we are an aging society and there actually is a need for more resources, I mean, that that is just the reality that we're dealing with and that the systems themselves are not necessarily set up to make caregiving any easier. So, mm-hmm. you know, that really is an added frustration mm-hmm. <laughs> as yes. to the screen um, that we don't have a solution for today, but it's, it's an oh. acknowledgement of yes. And we, we, we tell you these things and we know that there is also a challenge systemically with that. Mm-hmm. And I loved one person's idea. I think we need more of those as just these networks where people are able to like use each other as supports and, you know, resources, because honestly, you know, it, it may be hard to get governmental change, but maybe there are other ways that we could go about it, especially if you don't have like unlimited savings to pay for mm-hmm. caregivers to come in and, and all of those things. Exactly. Yeah. And I will say that is an area that I um, am working on as a researcher and with a group of researchers where we're trying to work on different health system changes that will accommodate care partners more readily and to decision making and with training. Um, And there was a recent change with uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid to bill for caregiver training. So there are some positive things on the horizon, but I 100% agree with the person who recommended building up those networks, um, because I think that's the best way to find resources right now, and probably will be, will continue to be the best um, way to find resources. So I know we're running a little short on time, so I'll just run through some um, strategies uh, for practicing self-care that I think can be helpful for people. I might skip this because I think you already have an assessment for seeing if you're engaging in self-care that you were um, sent or will be sent at the end of this presentation. Um, But I did want to share some ways that you can build a plan to try to um, build in time for yourself um, to practice self-care. So things like identifying any concerns you have, um, trying to place your needs and concerns in a priority order, and really writing down different action steps you can take to engage in self-care. Um, so I'll, I'll go through some different self-care practices that you can engage in that I think are helpful, and some of them are smaller than others. So Um, they may be more manageable to do right now. So things like maintaining your hobbies and regular activities. Exercise um, is something I'm sure we've all heard so many times impacts your mental and physical health. Uh, Eating a balanced and nutritious diet, drinking water, um, trying to get enough rest and taking time to relax, getting your regular checkups for yourself. Um, So going to your regular medical appointments, Um, and I know this one's a little small, but um, thinking about the future and what kind of goals you have for the future. So I know this is something that usually changes when you become a caregiver, but you can still have goals for the future and think through how you can work to achieve those goals. And then this is one that's easier said than done, but try to set limits and stick to them and bring in outside help to help you um, maintain those limits when you can. And this can be um, informal or formal support. And then before we end, I wanted to just share some ways that you can try to build your support network. Um, So trying to use your healthcare network, um, being really honest with your clinicians about um, your experience with Parkinson's disease Identify any symptoms that you find troublesome or difficult to manage um, for the person you're providing care for. And try to access a healthcare professional without the person you're providing care for if you need to. Sometimes there's topics that are difficult to discuss with the person in the room, um, or you may feel guilty talking about them in front of that person. So oftentimes clinicians will give you that opportunity um, in some way. 
Uh, and then, like I mentioned before, I think finding support from other caregivers, even through sessions like this, it seems like you all are sharing really great resources and strategies you already use. Um, so I think that's one of the best ways to build your network up. And you can talk to an experienced caregiver as well. Um, oftentimes through support groups, there's different levels of experience. So if it's helpful, try to seek out someone who's been in the role longer if you're maybe new to being a care partner. And then uh, just trying to establish and maintain a social network when possible. So looking for friends, uh, family, and other community groups um, like your church or neighborhood groups um, that can give you that outside support um, to help you in your role. Um, and that was the last slide, I think. So just, just at time. Um, and I left my email here. So if anyone has questions or wants any links to the papers I talked about or resources, feel free to reach out. And this has been incredible. Um, thank you. you. You covered everything so well. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, and I know it's a lot of information and there's been such wonderful uh, dialogue going on in the chat. If anyone wants to save their chat, all you have to do is go down to the little box by the little emojis, the three dots, and then it'll save it to your device. Um, and we do have another program in the series coming up and you guys, you kind of are evolving into these uh, discussions naturally because the next one is about grief and ambiguous loss and that is a part of that emotional experience. Um, and so we're going to be talking about that. I think it's October 12th. These are, I believe, individual uh, registration. I don't think when you sign up for one, it's all of them. I could be wrong. I, maybe they've done something new, but I think these are standalone registrations. And I believe it's being dropped in the, in the chat if you guys want to. This is... Uh, if you want to register for that, this is being recorded, so you can go back and listen. Um, if you want to hear it again or get the slides, we'll have those available as well. And then also the self-assessment that um, I mentioned at the beginning, and if you came on a little late, we sent to you or you're going to be getting in your email, does cover a lot of these things. So you're going to be asking yourself, you know, about your physical, your psychological, and your um uh, setting boundaries, your health in those ways and, and expectations. And so please uh, utilize those resources to kind of check where you are. And, and, you know, like some people have said, I didn't realize how stressed I was until it hit me either after the fact or something came along and it kind of hit them upside the head. And they're like, wow, I'm, I'm really, really stressed. Or they developed atrial flutter or, or something like that. Those are definite warning signs. So um, please take care of yourself. And so I want to thank you so much, Kate, for coming and sharing this incredible information. Very helpful. Yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity. And thanks everyone for being so engaged, I think. You get so much more out of it when you are engaged in the discussion and give your own experiences. Absolutely, I agree. I want to thank so much uh, Kyo Kieran for being a part of making this series happen and actually partnering with us and doing that survey because that information is so very helpful for us to understand the experience as well. So I know there's a lot more we can dive into and so we'll keep doing that. So thanks everyone. And so I want to invite you all to give Kate the weave of gratitude because this has been wonderful. So thank you so much for tackling this topic. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining us and have a great day.